Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lionberger Construction. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region, because business matters. On today's show, we'll talk to some of the top executives with local arts and culture organizations about rebounding from the pandemic and opening their doors again and where they pivoted during the height of the pandemic. Cindy Peterson is executive director at the Taubman Museum of Art. Cyrus Pace is executive director of Jefferson Center. Ginger Poole is producing artistic director for Mill Mountain Theater. And David Crane is executive director for the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra. And thanks to you all for joining me. Uh, let's get started here. Um, let's go around the room and um, let's ask uh, things are getting back to normal, quote unquote. Uh, I know uh, in May, David, I was at Symphony Under the Stars and I know Ginger Mill Mountain Theater did a uh, young audience as a production of Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, just how, how do you feel at this point? Uh, Cyrus, I know that I think the, the first thing I've seen on the schedule maybe is Tanya Tucker live. But just, just yep. let's go around the room, start with, uh, start with Ginger and, and move across this. How do you feel about things coming back to life? And of course, Cindy, the museum has, has been open. Go ahead, uh, Ginger. Thanks, Gene. Well, it does feel good. I think that all of us have um, really taken all of this very seriously as far as our planning and not only how to take care of our, our staff and our artists, but how do we you know, reintroduce this to the public and take care of our patrons and well as well. So all of the, it was nice to start practicing all of the stuff that we had been planning in person. And I will say that with our um, production of Midsummer, that was the first public thing that we had offered. And there, the capacity and the confidence that the community had, um, we were at capacity for all six performances. So that gave me confidence and faith that we are ready, as long as we continue to do things safely and by the book, um, that our audiences are gonna be there for us. You know, David Crane, uh, you seem very happy when I saw you at Symphony Under the Stars, a nice, uh, great crowd there, and uh, you guys are gearing up, and I guess um, uh, maybe by the time this airs, you will have announced some kind of schedule for the fall? We're, we're excited to reopen again, Gene. Uh, the concert on in May, you know, uh, we were a little bit limited capacity, but we were at capacity for what we're allowed to do there, over 1,300 people at the park. And it just doesn't come from, uh, I guess, the excitement of the musicians. I mean, the stage crew that was there, the sound company, the volunteers, security, everybody that's involved with producing music and events, um, it's been shuttered, it's been dark. And so uh, we're not just excited, we're giddy. There's something good to do, and this is what we do. And so we are excited about what's next. Uh, we announced in June um, an ex a season for the fall and the spring. Part of our big planning and discussions have all hinged upon what will the governor do? What will COVID do? What will the the opportunity to reopen? What will that look like? But as it looks today, looks like we're gonna be open and it's gonna be exciting. And uh, from Ginger's results and, and our results and others, it looks like the audience is ready to come back too. And that is just uh, over the moon exciting. Yeah, Cyrus, when you guys get cranked up again, I know you've been doing the listen now, gather later, online presentations also was a sort of a fundraiser, but are, are you expecting some really pent up demand once the doors open again at Jefferson Center? Yes, but I also think it's important to not budget as if there's gonna be demand for things now that there wasn't demand for before. Right. So right. we kind of have a, a, a guided approach to that. So we're excited as Ginger and David have said, we're, we're excited to get back to the work we've done. I think we're all surprised as arts leaders uh, as business managers that the most important thing we could do during the pandemic is take a breath and sort of wait, which is a weird thing to practice. It's a, a certain kind of mindfulness. Um, but in so doing, I think hopefully we've, um, we've saved the energy necessary to get back and be excited about what's coming up. And I do think there'll be some, uh, you know, some demand, some pent up demand in part, because I think people now know what it's like to go for a year without experiencing the arts. And, uh, I don't think people want to do that. So uh, we're excited and looking forward to a great season. We plan to go forward with a full season. Okay, and uh, Cindy Peterson at the Taubman Museum, did the Taubman actually shut down at any point last year? I know you uh, kind of pivoted, but were you shut down at any point and for how long before you reassessed and did what you needed to do to stay open? 
Yeah, we were, as the governor uh, did the lockdown, we shut down from that March timeframe, mid-March until the end of June. So we reopened our doors in July with uh, limited timings and those continue right now, Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. And so, you know, with a safe and welcoming environment, and so there's enough room in the galleries, gallery capacities, but as everybody's indicated, um, those continue to, to open up and change. So we're at 50% gallery capacity, it's plenty of room. And we just finished the reimagined um, week long uh, fundraiser for women's luncheon with six different elements from virtual event to um, smaller gatherings and intimate time ticket tours. And I think, you know, people are ready. They're, they're ready to go out, they're excited to come in. Uh, they're excited to see the arts and culture and they said you know it's just been so long but i also think for all of us we've really had a digital awakening in terms of you know what we've accomplished uh together collaboratively and also you know, for types of virtual interactions if it's, it's a tour if it's a um, something that's online, like for us, uh, 3D tours, online catalogs now, no paper, um, but also visiting. Um, we're able to visit artists and collectors across the country. And I know from Ginger, David, and, and Cyrus with their digital offerings, it's exposed us without boundaries of location. So I think that is you know, one of those things that will continue into the future and help us with visibility. One of the things I wanted to mention before we move on is uh, how you also pivoted, Cindy, with these art kits that you sent out. Talk about that. Was it brush kit? Brush kit? The brush pals, okay. correct. And that that continues to be a need. So you know, that community aligned part as a as a you know reevaluation and being able to meet the community where they are. So we do about two thousand a week of brush pals, art kits, activity sheets, and cards of encouragement and especially for Feeding America, Southwest Virginia and the Rescue Mission. So we have a whole you know, team of volunteers and staff and that goes out every single week and continues into the future along with our healing ceiling tiles. So um, that's been a, a wonderful integration working with different community youth groups, um, both on site, virtually being, you know, having tiles sent out and then they return and there's 400 that have been delivered to Karelian Clinic and are in you know, most of the pediatric areas. Mm -hmm. uh, Ginger Poole, talk about, uh, before I ask you about some of the shows coming up this fall, talk about uh, what Mill Mountain Theater learned about using video during this whole, th whole thing. As Cindy mentioned, it, it gave us that scope that we had no idea as far as the reach that we could make. I think through um, whether that was, you know, Polka Dots, the Cool Kids musical that we put out and streamed on Broadway on demand, um, that reached over 14 states and three countries, um, which is bizarre to think, you know, here's our, our children's show that um, has that type of reach. And the same thing as far as like stretching our other muscles um, into that digital um, or audio world of the podcast. I mean, that we've got, um, you know, listeners literally all over the world on a you know monthly podcast that's produced by Mill Mountain Theater, so that that type of reach and touch has been invigorating, and it's kept us going to know that um, people still care, people still want to hear from us, and um, it's been really helpful. What, what's the name of your podcast? Uh, Meet me at Mill Mountain. Okay. Do do you host it? I do, and okay. sometimes we have guest hosts, depending on you know who the artist is. So, um, but I do host most of them. But it's also fun to hear another voice behind the mm -hmm. microphone too. And just uh, you know, talk about uh, this summer, go in the fall. You've got a couple of musicals, Million Dollar Quartet, uh, and then a couple other shows coming up. Uh, Legally Blonde, and then the the uh, Christmas Story. Ed. So, uh, uh, you, you expect some pretty decent sized audiences for these pr productions. I mean, we, we want to be as hopeful and um, carry this out as safely as we can, and we will follow, you know, whatever that mandate is. As, as Cindy said, you know, right now we're at 50% capacity, and as things open up, we're hopeful that, um, that those numbers will shift. But if they don't, we're prepared um, as far as our budget and our planning. We're prepared for that 50% um, capacity, but um, we would love to see those numbers um, loosen up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And David Crane, what did the RSO learn during this past year as far as, uh, I know you guys put some concerts online and, and all that. Did that sort of help remind people that the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra is still out there? 
You know, it, it did, of course, by having a presence online. The challenging side for us is that, uh, you know, a symphonic uh, presentation that's got 30, 40, 50 plus people in it. Uh, and what we were able to produce online is more chamber-like in lots of ways. Really intimate music, really highlighting a lot of technique and skill by individual players. But it's hard to put on that 40 or 50 person orchestral event. Uh, the costs do outweigh the outcome when you get to those opportunities. But uh, it was exciting for us to produce it. And we may produce some in the future as we go forward. What we've learned is some of our patrons you know, as they get a little older or maybe aren't able to be as accessible to the concert hall as they would like to be, they like options. So we're gonna explore those options with them and see what we can do to provide the RSO uh, when they can't quite get to the RSO. Mm -hmm. So it's good, really exciting. And Cyrus, how did Listen Now Gather uh, later work for you? Sort of a blend of both what uh, Ginger and David have said. It doesn't necessarily pencil out on the finance side in a way that uh, it would work for us long term, frankly, but it did build relevance. We had audiences again in, in locations that we didn't expect. And I think most importantly, just spiritually, sort of existentially, it was an opportunity to do the things that we do, right? So we've dedicated our lives to making sure people have access to, to live music experiences and to, to great performing arts and to art that matters. So being able to connect with some of the artists we've presented over the years and a couple of new ones and making sure they had an opportunity to play. Um, you know, we had Renee Marie come, a great jazz singer, who of course spent a lot of time at Roanoke. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, she, you know, it's the first gig she had had in months, right? So it was an opportunity for them to employ themselves and, and do their work. Uh, moving forward, I do think as uh, others have mentioned that we will have some virtual opportunities, but probably a blend of you can either come see this live or get a virtual telecast of it. Um, but um, I still think the core of the performing arts are gonna be in-person experiences. So I, I don't imagine that taking uh, precedence at any point. And again, it's just about whether it pencils out on some level too. Right, you know, I'm just wondering, uh, Cyrus, you're a musician yourself. What's, what do you think it's been like for a lot of performers over the past year? You know, the same thing for actors, but what's, what's it been like for musicians over the past year that until recently, we're not able to get on stage. We're not able to, to you know, play music for people. Right, so uh, I think just like every sector, every business, uh, every skill set, it probably depends on uh, where you are uh, in terms of your uh, notoriety and ability to generate uh, revenue off of what you do. Uh, you know, touring artists like, let's say, I don't know, I'm thinking someone like George Benson uh, is fine staying at home because his net worth allows him to be off the road. But the bass player in his band or the drummer or the production folks that have depended on a George Benson tour for their careers for the last 40 or 50 years, uh, the agencies who aren't making 15% off of each of those bookings. Uh, so the trickle down is pretty tough. And then again, if you're a you know, if you're a beginning artist, the good news is you're probably already pretty close to the earth in terms of your expenses. Mm -hmm. uh, but many of the young players that I know just have just been on uh, unemployment, frankly, and benefited from federal support, allowing them to uh, at least survive in you know a three bedroom apartment with ten roommates in New York City for the <laughs> for the interim. You know, but we're the good news is we're seeing. Uh, traction again among the agencies. Uh, artists are getting back to touring. Uh, things that we scheduled last year are coming back. Uh, but it, it, it's a lost year in terms of revenue for m most of this industry. Some of which, of course, is going to be made up by federal support, which we couldn't be more thankful for. And uh, of course, support from our local community as well, which has helped us uh, you know, stay viable during a really challenging time. So I think it's been hard, frankly, mm -hmm. for everyone. Yeah, and I, that was going to be my next question is, uh, how is, you know, CARES Act money uh, help bridge the gap? And, and did, and, and you all can answer this, and did donors and sponsors kind of, you know, step up where they could during this pandemic? Def definitely for us, it was a, it's been a stopgap, both the federal funding, uh, both rounds of PPP, uh, we were able to get both rounds of PPP in addition to additional CARES funding, either federally or trickle down to the state through the Virginia Commission of the Arts or locally through the city of Roanoke and the Roanoke Arts Commission. 
And of course, uh, many of us, I'm sure, apply for the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant and are waiting to hear what the results of that will look like, uh, which could be a very meaningful allotment, a very, 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 very complicated application process. And what, and what, and what is that uh, for? The, what is that for? The Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, which is part of the last stimulus package that huh. was approved. Um, and it, it, I mean, David and I probably talked, I don't know, 10 times about some of the detail of that application. It's very complicated, but uh, will be, it's $16 billion were uh, given, basically are gonna be given to uh, you know, shuttered venues, people who present uh, museums, theaters, uh, movie theaters. So I think we're all very hopeful if we've applied that there's a good chance that we'll get it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I guess you all probably applied as well, right? We did, and we are in the same boat um, of the other uh, relief grants and opportunities that you listed as well, Cyrus. We're at Mill Mountain Theaters in the same place, but we that last big piece of the puzzle would be that shuttered venue operating grant. And then would that help restore some of the funds that you lost over the past year? I think it would help in every every category. Um, you know, lost revenue, um, some of the. Uh, infrastructure upgrades that we're having to do as far as to help with ventilation and whatnot. I mean, those were expenses that, you know, we had not budgeted for, um, you know, even looking at a different type of air filter to use in the theater. So um, that all comes at a cost and this would be a, a great benefit to all of us to have that um, help. Hmm. Yeah, David Crane, do, do, do you know when that's supposed to come about or when they're going to make a decision about uh, hmm. issuing some of that money? It's offered through the Small Business Association. So, uh, it, it, again, it was a very complicated process, and they even started it and stopped it a couple of times. And uh, with those uh, opportunities, we hear that they're going to have a very rigorous and manual review of every application. If that's true, there are thousands upon thousands of applications. So it could be a while before we hear back. So uh, again, we're hopeful that it does come through because it's only going to help us either you know recapture a little bit that was lost, but then help us go forward. Part of the, the restart, Gene, has to do with, uh, we're kind of first in, first out. When everything shut down, certainly um, we all just stopped flat and some were able to restart in some way, shape or form. Now you're seeing restaurants and small businesses come back. The arts for the most part, we haven't been able to do much. Uh, our whole business is built on uh, the mass audience, uh, having enough people come, uh, working off a social society, not a shuttered society. And so as we all come out of this, it's not exactly certain, and we're hopeful, because again, all indicators say people want to come back, but we're going to have some audience attrition. Uh, we all know that. The question is how much? Uh, will they all come back? Uh, maybe not in the fall, maybe in January. Will COVID come back in some way that makes people nervous and we have to change and, and modify again? There's still a lot of unknowns, but we have to be positive, we have to be hopeful. And uh, with the grant, that is a, a big ray of hope going forward to say, well, if something does happen and we have to slow down a little bit, there's funds to help us again, bridge the gap, weather the storm and come out on the other side, not a changed organization in the wrong sense, but a changed organization and we're ready to go forward. So a uh, lot of optimism, we're hopeful. Yeah, yeah. that was exact, that was, super well said because it's really about capitalizing a return right. to do the work that we do you know we That's went right. at jefferson center from full time 14 full-time employees to seven pretty much overnight and we're slowly starting to rebuild that i know that's true for a lot of you folks as well so you know it's a three to six month hiring process um ginger won't be surprised to hear that the most complicated of that is being production positions right yes. the, you know, want to work on st the stage. We have a position open currently for our technical technical director, which I think could take me two or three months to find. And we think we've posted that position at a pretty assertive um, salary range as well. But some folks just simply got out of the business. They got out of the industry, you know, and decided once the train was off the tracks in terms of that effort for their uh, career, they may not get the train back on the track. So. Uh, any support, any financial support basically allows us to capitalize or return to business. So we're hopeful. Well, like you know, like you said, I was thinking about this when, God forbid, something like this happens again, uh, you know, businesses that are based on audiences coming in, you know, and, and, and are not places where people can get food or eat or whatever or get their medicine, 
are probably going to be the first first casualties. So I'm just wondering is if there if there's anything and you can go around the room on this, but is there anything that you guys are all thinking about for the future, some kind of contingency plan or starting your own endowment or something to kind of, you know, put something away to get through something like this. I'm wondering if that's entered any of your your, your thoughts. Well, we're we're actually um, starting, we're gonna uh, build a pharmacy and a restaurant <laughs> and a bar. And so I think we're gonna be fine because people will have to come here for their medicine <laughs> and their food and their alcohol. Iris, let's have coffee after this. Let me pick yeah. your brain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's my that's my great idea. You know, Gene, it's it's been challenging. Part of a lot of our, if you will, circle of business, right? We're involved with concerts, we're involved with education, we're also involved with actually working with people with Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, from our perspective, from the musical perspective. And lots of people are doing different work all around those subjects and more. The challenging, the challenging side of it is uh, if we decide to have a little mission drift, and if you will, I know it's kind of joking, but I do know of an orchestra in the Netherlands that has a dairy and they <sighs> have a crazy business plan and it's, it's really eclectic. And you look at it and go, wow, that's really interesting. But then you think, are we going to get in the business of being dairy farmers? I mean, are we going to open a convenience store or the symphony hot dog stand? I mean, that's a really stretch, a uh, big stretch for us. So again, while we can try to be as eclectic as possible, none of us are probably going to start building cars or making chips or things that might have another business avenue. What we do and how we serve the community is so specific. And again, social society, shuttered society, schools shut down, hard to get to the kids. Uh, if nursing homes aren't available, it's hard to get to those folks that are, need those services. And if concerts aren't running, for us and our business model, that's the main core of what we do. It all circles around the opportunity to perform music. So mm-hmm. um, we've thought about it a lot. Is there some diversity that makes some sense? So when you come back to it, the answer is uh, what we do is so specific and special. That's why you don't see duplicated services on the screen, right? What people are doing is so special. Um, it really matters that the focus stays uh, right there where it is, right. uh, at least in my opinion. So it's really challenging to say, let's let's go too far or stretch it out a little bit. So, in other words, we won't see Maestro, we, we won't see Maestro David Wiley slinging hot dogs before he gets on on stage, right? Uh, not a plan, but I'm not saying it won't happen. So how's that? <laughs> But but I do think we've all found ways to really adapt and and learned lessons from this past year. So we have contingency plans. We we're, you know, have endowments, continue to build those for for that purpose. But, um, you know, stay true to our mission and to our strategic goals. All of us, as we as as the examples around the room, you know, we do do that, but continue to meet the community, all of us in, in new and innovative ways that will, you know, continue to help us as we've built our resiliency, but also our versatility. I know, Cindy, uh, I'm sure you felt that you were building some momentum, getting more people into the museum, that type of thing. Or, or how do you get that momentum back? Is it just put on a real splashy exhibition or what? I think it's a combination of, um, you know, people are ready to come out, as everybody said, you know, enjoy the arts and the culture. Uh, We're going to be opening up our first Fridays again as part of Art by Night, but in a different model. So we've engaged with our young professionals and headed up a steering committee of of new people to the museum so that they will be um, spearheading that public programming. I think that, you know, engaging new areas, um, exhibitions, you're right, you're right. So in our new season in the fall, um, we have fashioning to the future. So we have everything from uh, technology and fashion um, to Afrofuturism and um, with Ruthie Carter. So there's just lots of different ways, but that, you know, the continuing with um, the community programming and being safe, being safe and welcoming and inclusive. Let's go around the room. We got just a couple of minutes left. Ginger, are you excited about the uh, you know late summer and the, and the fall and the winter season coming up? As David said, we're giddy. Um, we're we're very excited about where we're going, what we're offering, and even the the style shows that we've chosen. We've chosen them very strategically. They are, are shows that still have a big bang as far as a wow factor, but they're still very manageable from the operating side. Um, they're not giant, huge casts, but they still will have a wild factor at the box office. You know, David Crane, I'm wondering, uh, I'm just wondering if maybe the players and 
David Wiley, whatever, you know, after being on hiatus for so long that they're going to come back when they hit the stage again, and they did, of course, in, in early May, are they going to have a renewed sense of appreciation for what they do maybe and for being in front of an audience? Well, I, I do think so. I mean, we, again, when I mean it's been quiet, I mean, so if you're a, a college professor and you play with us, uh, you've had some work, but some of it's gone away. If you're just a total gigger and play with us and play a lot of venues around the state or the tri-state region, uh, it's been dark. If you play weddings, it's been dark. Uh, so to get back to work, I think it's just an absolute uh, feeling of accomplishment. We made it. We made it through this dark period. And again, Cyrus is right. There's a lot of people that have stepped away, if you will. They've picked new careers. They've done some training. And he said, you know, is this viable long term? And the answer is, if you were on the fence before, you were really on the fence when it was dark. And mm. so to say that we've made it through that time period or you're coming back to it, again, stagehands, security people, uh, the sound company who has been out of work for nine months and the company's still alive, uh, they're thrilled. I mean, just thankful to be back and, and getting back to pulling cable for eight hours, right? Running the lights, doing all the work that is long and tedious and so worth it. And so uh, everybody's excited. And just to wrap up quickly, Cyrus, I guess you're looking forward to all that, watching the guys put up lights in the whole nine yards. Exactly. And we've also booked shows for the fall that I think will be hard for people to say no to. So we're being very strategic about what we're presenting to make sure there are things that people are very excited about and, um, and it will be hard for them to miss. I think that's our strategy. And we've also, frankly, just really negotiated very hard with the agencies and said this is a difficult environment. Uh, so let's be benevolent in terms of deal structure so that it all makes sense for everyone. And so far, that conversation has been fruitful. Right. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Welcome to the new normal. Uh, Cindy Peterson, Cyrus Pace, Ginger Poole, and David Crane. Thank you all for joining me today. If you have any questions or show suggestions, email us at businessmatters at blueridgepbs.org. And if you missed any of our previous episodes, you can watch them on our website at blueridgepbs.org. Thank you.